Greetings, Sentinel Powerlifters, and welcome to Codex Compliant. Let's take a gander at the early Imperial Armour books. Who doesn't love Forge World, Games Workshop's premium resin model producing subsidiary? Well, aside from your wallet, obviously. Since 1998, Forge World has been producing various miniatures, as well as many not so miniature miniatures, to be used in GW's various games. But what is a Warhammer model without rules, aside from a nice miniature for you to build and paint? To begin with, the rules for Forge World models were printed in the Citadel Journal as the Imperial Armour Column, but the rules were always considered to be, for want of a better word, unofficial, despite it being a GW publication. So although anyone could use them, they were more akin to house rules that everybody had to agree on. And historically, Warhammer players, be they Fantasy or 40k, don't tend to embrace those kinds of things in the same way that, say, D&D players do. And yes, GW could have just handed the journal rules over to the game design department to tweak and put their official stamp on, thus solving the problem, but for whatever reason, that just wasn't a thing that happened. However, an opportunity for official rules arrived with Jervis Johnson's vehicle design rules for 3rd edition, the ones we talked about way back in our chapter approved video. Those were official rules, so anything made with them was also considered official, so the editor of the Citadel Journal at the time, Warwick Kinraid, used those rules to create stat lines for Forge World models which were published in a pair of books called Imperial Armour and Imperial Armour 2. Not to be confused with Imperial Armour Volume 1 and Volume 2, those are entirely different books, put them out of your mind for now, that is just GW being unnecessarily confusing again. So, let's take a look at what these rule books contained. Rules! That's, th these books con contained rules. Imperial Armour was released in the year 2000 and, perhaps fittingly, contained only Imperial Armour, meaning vehicles for the Imperial Guard. Many were based on the Lehman Russ and Chimera chassis, but there were others like Super Heavies and Aircraft. Unlike the later book series that would inherit the name, it was relatively light on lore and heavy on rules. However, there was a short story written by Gav Takeshot Thorpe about an Imperial tank company battling a horde of Chaos tanks on a planet that we're going to assume is pronounced Gnoria Prime, because the only other pronunciation that we can think of would be... unfortunate. But let's get into the units. The first section was dedicated to tanks and had rules for the Lehman Russ Conqueror, the Thunderer Siege Tank, the Destroyer Tank Hunter, two variants of Lehman Russ Vanquisher, and the Lehman Russ Executioner, which helpfully establishes a pattern you'll see throughout these books. A mix of units that are either still available from Forge World, were mainline units anyway and were reprinted here since Forge World made their own version, have since become mainline codex units and available in plastic kits, or have been lost to time and reside only in Legends now. One of the latter is the Destroyer Tank Hunter, which was very similar to the Thunderer, but instead of a Demolisher Cannon, it had a really big laser that could deliver LAS Cannon level damage, but with a blast template. Also, according to the fluff, they used to be very common, but are now pretty rare due to the Mechanicus not really being able to easily replicate the tech anymore. In fact, Thunderers are mostly modified Destroyers, replacing the hard-to-repair weapon with something simpler. Which makes it weird that Thunderers and not Destroyers are the ones that are still available to buy from Forge World, but also oddly fitting. The rest were what you'd expect, variants on the Ross chassis with a 3rd edition version of those weapons. The only real thing of note was that the Vanquisher's battle cannon fired like a regular battle cannon normally, but you could choose to fire anti-tank shells instead, which didn't use a blast template, but rolled two dice for armour penetration. Although a nice feature of these books is that they give some advice on using the different units in-game. For example, the Vanquisher's advice points out that the extra points it costs over a regular Russ are somewhat wasted if it's not fighting vehicles. And the Destroyers suggests that you could use it as an objective for both sides to fight over since they're so canonically valuable. Oh, and also the units had these fun little statistics showing off things like weight, ground clearance, barrel length, etc. We don't know dick and or balls about tanks, but if you do, please feel free to let us know in the comments how realistic or nonsensical these stats seem. The next section was for Super Heavies. Although, before getting into the units, it had to explain how Super Heavies worked, since they weren't a thing that showed up in the base version of the game at the time. So, to make this very brief for those that didn't play with the old vehicle rules, when you attacked a vehicle in 3rd edition, you'd roll to hit, and if you did, then you'd roll again and add that value to the strength of the weapon that you're using. If that value was equal to or greater than the armor value of the side of the vehicle you're facing, then there were tables to roll on to see what damage was done. Which one you rolled on depended on if you equaled the armor, a glancing hit, or exceeded it, a penetrating hit. 
This system did mean that it was much easier to one-shot vehicles than it is in 9th edition, since even a single bolt around to the relatively unarmoured rear of a Rus could potentially destroy the vehicle, but by the same token that bolt around was physically incapable of harming it if shot at the front or sides. Also, since you could disable weapons, it meant that we've played games during editions that used versions of this system, where dreadnoughts were left completely without weapons and had to resort to running around the table trying to kick things to death. Which is... you know, that's just great. The Super Heavy Rules took this, substituted their own versions of the damage tables, and added structure points, which worked like wounds. However, if reduced to zero structure points, they didn't just die. They rolled on the catastrophic damage table, and although usually this would result in the tank being destroyed and maybe exploding violently, it could also result in the tank being repaired if you were very, very lucky. This meant the system had similar pros and cons to the regular vehicle system, where it was technically possible for a lucky shot from the right angle to destroy it in one hit, but it also made it impervious to a lot of weapons. These Super Heavies were also pretty slow due to the lumbering special rule, and could fire at different targets with different weapons, something few things could do back then. There were two Super Heavies in this book, the Bane Blade and the Shadow Sword, showing off the models Forge World made of them before they got a plastic kit. Rules-wise, they're fairly unremarkable, although seeing the Shadow Sword's Volcano Cannon only being Strength 10 feels underpowered compared to the Strength 16 it currently has. That is, until you realise that 10 was the maximum back then, and it could do multiple structure points of damage at once. After the Super Heavies, there were the Chimera variants, like the Salamander, and, well, some variants of the Chimera. Salamanders, currently languishing in Legends, were stripped down open top vehicles that came in Command and Scout varieties. The Command ones had a Heavy Flamer and Heavy Bolter combo, could be taken as HQ choices, and had improved comms, which allowed you to re-roll one reserve roll per turn and re-roll checks for preliminary bombardment. The Scout variant had an auto cannon instead of the Heavy Flamer, and could zip around the table since it counted as a fast vehicle. The two variants of the basic Chimera just replace the main turret with a Heavy Bolter or a Heavy Flamer, things that the Chimera can just take as standard now, although admittedly in here the Heavy Bolter was twin-linked, so it's a little fancier. Next, there was a whole bunch of miscellaneous stuff, like the Sentinel Power Lifter, something so pointless from a competitive standpoint that the book's own advice for using it was purely role-playing in nature. Honestly, I think the folks at Forge World had just watch Aliens one too many times. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Similarly, there's the Trojan, a vehicle meant for towing artillery and other vehicles that was, again, more for narrative flair. Although it could be used to tow around a selection of artillery pieces if they were upgraded with a towing carriage. These platforms, along with the option for those towing carriages, were also in here and came in Earthshaker, Hydra and Manticore flavours. And speaking of which, there was also rules for the Hydra and Manticore in their more conventional mounted on a Chimera chassis format. Oh, there was also the Medusa that for some reason we forgot to include in the script, so I'm having to hastily insert this segment after doing everything else. Yay! Lastly in this section were turret emplacements, which were, as the name suggests, just emplacements that could be fitted with one of many different turrets, usually found on guard vehicles. These were normally only for use in games where fortifications were allowed and counted as troops choices, which feels weird in a way I can't quite wrap words around. We're also pretty sure that these are the only things in these books that don't have some form of playable rules anymore, so, you know, that's a thing. Finally, you had the flyers, which were weird. Like Super Heavies, flyers weren't in the base 3rd edition rules, so they printed them in here. They weren't like regular units, they always entered from reserve, even if the game type normally wouldn't allow it, and didn't actually move until your opponent's turn, where they do an attack run. The enemy would shoot at them, only hitting on sixes unless they have an anti-aircraft mount, because, you know, plane go fast. Then the flyer would shoot at the enemy and bugger off the table, back into reserve, able to return again on subsequent turns on a roll of 2+. plus. As I said, weird. There were just two flyers, both of which had two variants. First up was the Lightning, with this older version of the model having a slightly different weapon loadout than the current, not actually very similar model, looking a little different to a lot of Imperial craft due to the nose not being a basic geometric shape, standing defiantly against the concept of aerodynamics. The in-universe origin for the Lightning is a bit of a messy subject too. Okay, so in this book, and on the Forge World store page currently, the Lightning's origin is that its STC, amusingly referred to as an STD in the book, was discovered as part of the Sate Sane Crusade, and has only seen widespread adoption relatively recently. 
However, in Horus Heresy Book 2 Massacre, the Lightning shows up as a fancy Great Crusade era fighter created by the Arch Magos Arbiter Psychos Thule. You can, like Lexicanum does, treat these two origins as just being the origins for two different patterns of the aircraft that share the same name, representing the two different models it's had. But then it'd be kind of weird that they're both called Lightnings, considering the two models are so different in configuration and origin. Honestly, it feels more like the Saint Saint Crusade origin was supposed to be retconned entirely, and no one has noticed that the current Forge World models page has the old origin in its description. It's almost like... When you have a vast fictional universe that is contributed to by countless different creative people and has been retconned frequently, that occasionally something's going to slip through the net and we probably shouldn't have spent quite so long obsessing over this one minor detail. Oh, and the other version of the lightning was the lightning strike. Eh, I see what you did there. Which had unlimited range missiles instead of an autocannon. Also, this old lightning design, alongside some of the other things in these books, ended up in Dawn of War, so... That's neat. The last units of the book are the Marauder and its variant, the Marauder Destroyer, which were super heavy flyers. So combine all the super heavy nonsense with the flyer nonsense, and that was using a Marauder in 3rd edition. And you know the artwork in the later Imperial Armor series that showed these sci-fi vehicles in a way reminiscent of modern technical drawings, lending a certain authenticity and realism that you don't get in the more fanciful artwork you normally see? Well, those are in here too. Sort of. Instead of art, they had photos of the models, which, although not having quite the same vibe, does let you get a good look at them. Even if a handful of them had some Photoshop work done that is a bit rough at times. Most of the edits were just adding markings to the tanks, which worked alright until you get to the Trojan, which, for reasons that baffle linguists and theologians to this day, proudly displayed the words Dragon Wagon in what looks like Comic Sans. <laughs> I feel like it's art. Speaking of the artwork, the other thing you'll have no doubt noticed is that instead of the drawn artwork you find in regular codexes, this mostly used model photographs instead, and the photos are usually edited to try and create a more realistic scene. They did this by hiding things like infantry bases or flight stands and adding effects to the shots along with other Photoshop wizardry to varying success, including copious use of lens flares. It kinda reminds me of the promotional images Armorcast used on their large resin 40k models. Again, this is something that would continue into the later Imperial Armor series, although these days they're a little more lens flare shy. However, I'm sure some of you are wondering where all the alien vehicles are. Man cannot live on Imperial vehicles alone, as a famous philosopher absolutely did not say. Well, you see, they were saving all that good stuff for the sequel. Imperial Armor 2 was released a year later in 2001, and despite being quite a bit shorter and, annoyingly, slightly taller, it stuck with the same basic formula as Imperial Armor 1, although it was full of Xeno vehicles this time, namely that of the Orcs, Eldar, and Dark Eldar. The main crew behind it was pretty much the same as the first book, right down to it having a short story by Gav Thorpe, this time about an Orc pilot called Crookfang attacking an Eldar settlement alongside a ground assault. The ground assault suffers greatly at the hands of some unknown Eldar super heavy tanks before Crookfang's fighter bomber, the Death Blaster, is suddenly riddled with fire from an Eldar fighter. There's always someone faster than you, he told himself just before Death Blaster exploded into the ground and hurled his corpse through the shattered canopy. Oh, and also, Imperial Armor 2 was sent to us by Shanus, so you can thank him for the extra length of this video since it was originally just going to be the first book. So, after reiterating the Super Heavy and Flyer rules, as well as adding to the Super Heavy Flyer rules, it detailed some of the ever-so-fancy vehicles for the Eldar. This started off with the Wave Serpent, an odd choice since those rules were already printed in the 3rd edition Eldar Codex, but whatever, they wanted to show off their pretty model for it, and it's not like any of us had the power to stop them. Also in the things based around the Falcon Grav Tank kit department was the monofilament launching death machine, the Night Spinner, helpfully accompanied by a quote from a guardsman who encountered some of the poor buggers killed by it. Ugh, what's happened to these guys? It looks like they've been sliced and diced. After that, there were the Eldar Super Heavies, the Cobra and the Scorpion, which have both had their models remade since this book was published. Despite not being quite as heavily armoured as the Imperial Super Heavies from the previous book, they did have a 4-plus invulnerable save to ranged attacks due to having an energy field. 
And since vehicles in 3rd edition didn't get armor saves at all, usually, that was pretty neat. Also, the Cobra's Distort Cannon fired a Strength 10 AP1 Ordnance Blast, so that's a weapon with the highest strength possible, that would bypass any armor save that wasn't invulnerable, and did so with the largest blast template available at the time. It also did extra damage to things that used structure points. Let's just say it was a good job it was relatively short range for something this powerful, and was one of those weapons you had to guess how far away your enemy was to shoot at them. Ah, the days before pre-measuring. Then you had some Eldar Flyers. The Nightwing was a pretty standard flyer, but also got an energy field save. The model, which is still around, has a rather fun feature in that it has variable sweep wings. As in, the wings can change their position to be swept back or extended. In the modern game, it can be done to alter how the unit moves, but sadly in this iteration didn't actually do anything. Still really cool though. The Vampire Raider was a rather large super heavy flyer Forge World used to make. Seriously, that bit at the front that looks like the front of a falcon is pretty much the same size as the front bit of a falcon. This thing was commonly used by Eldar Corsairs and cost a whopping 780 points to take, whilst having the same armour value as an orc truck. Granted, also having that 4 plus invulnerable save again and being a super heavy, so it's not so bad. However, it did have a trick that none of the other flyers we've seen so far did. It could land. Yeah, this thing was also a transport and so could drop down 30 troops onto the battlefield and whilst landed worked like any other super heavy vehicle. Well, I mean, it couldn't move but you weren't dealing with those peculiar old flyer rules is all I mean. The last Eldar flyers were for their goth siblings, the Dark Eldar. There's the Raven, which looks like a scaled up old Reaver jet bike model, and the Razor Wing, which was pretty much just two Ravens bolted together, giving it slightly more firepower than the Raven but little else. It's likely based on real world twin fuselage planes like the twin Mustang. Also, given the awkward looking nature of this old model, I believe the new Razor Wing model is what the kids would refer to as a glow up. Now we move on to the Orc vehicles. The first is the Gun Wagon, which although doesn't directly have rules in the modern game, could be run as a big track, albeit with a bit of weapon loadout finagling. Gun Wagons are an interesting thing design-wise, since they seem to be a bridge between the modern ramshackle aesthetic of Orcs and the look as sported by the Rogue Trader Battle Wagon. The fluff for them also had some interesting stuff in it. For instance, vehicles like the Gun Wagon come in many different forms, and some seem to be imitations of Imperial designs. It's also stated that it is not uncommon over a prolonged campaign for the same orc vehicle to be locked as destroyed multiple times due to the mechs salvaging them over and over again, and that gun wagons are commonly misidentified as battle wagons by inexperienced soldiers. But given that earlier in the segment it talks about how much they vary in appearance and design, I imagine that's an easy mistake to make. I mean, these are all battle wagons, cut your soldiers some slack. God damn. And speaking of battle wagons, they were in here too! Like the Wave Serpent, this was a repeat of an entry from a main codex, but at least here it came with some extra options. A thing of note is that the canonical difficulty of categorising Orc vehicles from a moment ago is elaborated upon here. So a regular battle wagon can be upgraded to a battle fortress for 150 points, which made it a super heavy and so harder to kill, along with being festooned with even more weapons. But they also state that battle wagons tend to grow as time goes on due to more and more weapons and armour being welded onto them. Because… orcs. To the point that some of the things Imperial tank crews label as battle fortresses are actually just particularly big battle wagons. Although I can't imagine orcs care much for this level of specificity. Oh, and a fun thing in here is that it had a little lore dump about the Rin's World campaign, which mentions the event of the spin-off game Bombers Over Das Sulfur River. A game that we will do a video on one day, you know, when we get hold of some boards for it that aren't horrifically damaged. Next was the Grot Bomb Launcher, which was an old war track with a large missile on the back piloted by a Grot that could only be used once per game. Basically, it was a dirt cheap, tiny, orcish death strike. Dirt cheap as in points, not the model, it was still Forge World after all. The last units in here were bombers and fighter bombers, the latter just being a smaller version of the former and the former being exactly what it sounds like, a bomber but for orcs. Although just to bring back that trademark GW unnecessary confusion, by the time of Imperial Armor Volume 8 in 2010, the fighter bomber model would be renamed to the fighter and the bomber would be renamed to the fighter bomber, with a new unit taking the name bomber that never seemed to actually get a 40k scale model made of it. The fighter would later be renamed again to the attack fighter, so if you happen to have an original fighter bomber model and want to play it in current year, you don't use the fighter bomber legends entry, since that's actually the bomber, and instead use the attack fighter entry. 
Games Workshop. Why are you like this? And funny we should mention Bombers over to Sulphur River earlier, because the little How to Play section for Orc Bombers does mention that you can play out a scenario of the same name using them that's kinda similar to the setup of the board game, just with, you know, much bigger planes. As with the first book, it had a section with pictures of the models, although the photoshopping here was mostly reserved for putting Orc symbols on the vehicles. Similarly, it also had a Know Your Enemy chart, showing off the relative sizes of all the vehicles in here. Well, except the Razor Wing, since from the side it would have looked identical to the Raven. A special mention also goes to a couple of bits of art pinched from the Death Squadron comics over in Inferno magazine. Especially this one of the inside of a fighter bomber cockpit that is so full of fun details that in mentioning any of them we feel like we'd be unfairly ignoring the others. So instead we'll say nothing and trust that your big, pretty eyes can take them all in and appreciate them. The final thing in here is a little in-universe description of an attack on an Imperial supply facility during the Rinsworld campaign by Da Vulture Squadron led by Da Black Baron. Vulture Squadron was actually mentioned in the Rinsworld Air War book for Aeronautica Imperialis a couple of years ago, if you happen to be wondering about their current canonicity. As was Bombers Over Da Sulphur River, because we'd already mentioned it twice in this episode and rule of threes, baby. So those were the original two Imperial Armour books. They weren't very long or flashy compared to the later Imperial Armour series, but they established a tone that those later ones would follow. That of books that feel less fantastical and try to show the war machines and battles of the far future in a more grounded way. They feel more grown up, if that's a term that can ever really be applied to these very silly toy soldiers. That we love. It's also interesting to see how much more detailed the Forge World kits have become. I mean, sure, a lot of the ones we've looked at here look great, and many are, at the time of writing, still on sale. But some, like the Baneblade, look a little primitive compared to the things they, or Games Workshop proper, put out today. The Imperial Armour series would begin putting out the hardback numbered volumes it's most well known for in 2003, and by this point, with some of the books having second editions, update books, spin-offs, and indexes spanning from 3rd edition up to 9th, the series has become a lot more complicated than it was back in the early 2000s, but these two books were where it all started. Well, okay, technically it started with the Citadel Journal articles, but let's not get too pedantic over it. You're regretting kissing that thing, aren't you? I think I've got flock in my mouth. <laughs>